Welcome back to our section on the Synoptic Gospels. Today we will talk about the Gospel of Matthew. The symbol for Matthew is the human figure. So I took you to the toll booth here at the George Washington Bridge. As we will see later, Matthew is often associated with a tax collector whom Jesus calls as a disciple. So I thought the toll collection booth here at the George Washington Bridge might be a good backdrop. Well, it was a bit noisy right there at the toll booth, so I came up here to Fort Lee Park, where we see the defense defenses used by George Washington during the Revolutionary War in 1776. I came here because before we get into Matthew, I want you to get an appreciation for how horrifying the time must have been when the Gospels were written. Remember, if we date Mark around 65 CE, then he would have written his Gospel right before the first Jewish-Roman War. I found these two videos on YouTube, um, one about the siege of uh, and total destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. You can watch it here and read Mark 13 um, one more time. The other about the Roman siege and taking of the Masada in 73 CE. You can watch that here as well. And Matthew probably wrote his gospel either shortly before taking the Masada or shortly thereafter. Let these events sink in for a bit before reading these gospels again. But now back to Matthew. And instead of going back to the noisy toll booths, uh, I'll, I'll stay here with a nice view of the GW. So who is Matthew? Well, we don't really know. The gospel itself is anonymous. Early church leaders, also called the patristic writers, believed that this gospel was written by the Apostle Matthew. If the author was the Apostle Matthew, who walked alongside Jesus, then this gospel could claim direct apostolic claim written by an eyewitness. There is some support for this op opinion. All ancient manuscripts bear the name Gospel according to Matthew. The name Matthew, as in the tax collector, is mentioned in the Gospel twice. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 and chapter 10 verse 3. By contrast though, the tax collector in Mark is called Levi uh, of Alphaeus and Luke just calls him Levi. Tradition claims that Matthew wrote the Gospel in Hebrew, which someone translated later into Greek. However, there are some possible doubts that Matthew, the tax collector, who uh, could have written this Gospel. The use of the Greek language in, in the Gospel of Matthew is way too good for it to be written and translated from the Hebrew. And the apostle and tax collector Matthew would most likely not have been a particularly ed educated person who would command the Greek language as well as the Gospels Greek suggests. Compared with Mark, Matthew's Greek is often more concise and correct. Matthew follows Mark's order of events in the Gospel and improves many stories over Mark. It would be hard to imagine that Mark would have taken the Gospel of Matthew, reduced it and used a lesser Greek in doing so. Also, if the apostle and tax collector Matthew were the author of the Gospel, he would have been an uh, old man when he wrote it. Even if we assume that Matthew could have been uh, maybe 10 years younger than Jesus, um, that would still make him uh, between 60 to 70 years old by the time he wrote the Gospel. And why would Matthew want to wait that long to share the story of Jesus? Why would he use much of the material from Mark and not just tell the story of Jesus himself? That begs the question when the Gospel of Matthew was actually written. Jesus lament over Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24, which in the Gospel is set as a future vision, seems to reflect that the events have already taken place and that the author of Matthew has lived through the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. 
Therefore, a date shortly after the temple destruction in 70 CE is most plausible. What is Matthew's charisma or message? Jesus is the Messiah, much like Mark. But there's more. Jesus is the new Moses. He is the fulfillment of the Torah. And thirdly, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. These themes pass through the entire gospel. The gospel begins with a genealogy that ties Jesus to King David, the anointed king, the Messiah of Israel. The genealogy actually starts all the way with Abraham as the forefather to show that the entire history of Israel uh, culminates in Jesus. That's why Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the city of David, where David was born. That's particularly interesting because we normally know Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth, suggesting that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. But Matthew wants to make sure his audience makes the connection between Jesus and King David, which makes Jesus the new Messiah. We also have the story of the three wise men from the East. They are astronomers and they decipher the stars that indicate that, that there was a newborn king in Israel. That's how they set out on their trip. And that news, of course, threw King Herod off balance. Remember, the three wise men are first going to Jerusalem, knocking on King Herod's door, because where else would a new king be born? Of course, that sets off the whole hunt for this newborn king, the Messiah. And then Matthew also wants his audience to know that Jesus is the new Messiah. Moses is the symbol for the Torah. It was Moses who freed the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt and const constituted Israel as a people by receiving the Torah from, the, from God on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And so Matthew draws a number of parallels between Moses and the story of Jesus that are unique to Matthew. We don't find these stories in Mark, Luke, or any other gospel. So first, Joseph is taking Mary and Jesus to Egypt, right after uh, they found out that um, Herod is after Jesus' life. We find that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Just as those, Joseph's family in Genesis, Jacob and his 12 sons, settled in Egypt. Second, King Herod kills the little children in Matthew 2 verses 16 through 18, like Pharaoh killed the children in Exodus 1. Third, when Herod died in Matthew 2 chapter, verse 19 to 21, God's angel called Joseph to take Jesus and Mary back to Israel, just like the Israelites left Egypt in Exodus 12. Fourth, in the gospel then follows Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, just like Israel went through the waters of the Red Sea in Exodus 14 to escape from the evil, namely Pharaoh. Fifth, Jesus then gets tempted in the desert by, for, for 40 days in Matthew 4, chapter, verses 1 through 11, just like Israel wandered through the desert for 40 years with many temptations along the way, books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. Sixth, Jesus then preaches the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew 5 through 7. Just like Moses got the law, the Ten Commandments, from Mount Sinai, see the book of Exodus, Jesus pre preaches the fulfillment of that law. Jesus claims to, to be the law or Torah himself. All of this gets Jesus into conflict with the Pharisees and the Sadducees as they see the practice of the Torah, the law, uh, differently, which then gets Jesus crucified. All this shows how Matthew's message, his charisma, is to show that Jesus, whom Mark already identified as the Messiah, indeed came to fulfill the story 
that God had already started with Israel in the Old Testament. And part of what uh, the Torah requires are sacrifices to God. For when the Torah, the law, was not followed, sacrifices were made to atone for breaking the Torah. Jesus fulfills that part of the Torah by his own sacrifice on the cross. And now that the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed and sacrifices can no longer be made, they are also no longer necessary because Jesus fulfilled the Torah by sacrificing himself once and for all. While the Jewish people believed that God's presence dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem, Matthew tells us that now Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. And finally, here are a few characteristics of the Gospel of Matthew. First, Matthew is the longest gospel. It has 28 chapters ending with the Great Commission. It said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. After the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus' followers are now sent out into the world to proclaim the good news that the Torah is fulfilled in Jesus. Therefore, those who follow Jesus are reconciled to God without the temple. In Jesus uh, is now the presence of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And second, Matthew uses the word church, ecclesia, a few times, a few times. He mentions the foundation of the church that Peter will be the rock on which Jesus will build his church in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus also gives instructions about how to deal with the people in the church that have wronged each other, Matthew 18, verse 17. This shows that there is already some kind of church structure in existence at the time of writing the Gospel of Matthew. This reinforces the idea that the Gospel is written in the second part of the first century CE. So, and now you can watch the Bible Project videos on the Gospel of Matthew. There are actually two. And we'll be back for Luke in the next session. Enjoy.